everybody. I'm Eric Patton. I am the Chief Investment Officer here at Cutler, and I'm joined today by Brian Knudsen. Uh, Brian is in our Seattle office. I'm in our Bellevue office, but uh, thank you all for joining us on uh, what is a sunny and, and gorgeous day here in Seattle, uh, and hopefully it's the same wherever you are. Uh, but uh, why don't I share my screen, and then we'll jump right into it and, and start talking about Cutler's market uh, outlook and our view on what's happening out there in the economy today. All right, but first, uh, as we always do, we're gonna um, show our disclosure pages. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out to all of you, uh, your portfolio might differ materially from the advice that we're providing in this presentation. Uh, so please discuss how uh, our views presented here today might impact your portfolio with your financial advisor. Um, you know, each of our clients has a portfolio that is really built for them, and uh, we want to make sure uh, that that what we're saying today works uh, with with how you view your portfolio and what your goals are as well. Uh, but let's talk about today's agenda, and we're going to start with a second quarter review. Uh, stocks are are up, uh, but not broadly speaking. Really, uh, a segment of the stock market is up that's pulling all of the stock market higher. Uh, and then we're going to ask three big questions. Uh, the first, uh, where's the recession? Uh, we've, we've been hearing about a recession for over a year. Is it still on its way or have we moved past that? Can we look forward uh, to a period of economic growth? Uh, and then secondly, how are households positioned? Uh, those of you that have joined our webinars in the past know that uh, we believe households are a very important part of the economy and economic growth. Uh, so we want to monitor that and see how uh, see how everyone's doing in terms of their finances and, and how that might impact the economy going forward and really how that might impact a possibility of a recession as well. And then the last question, uh, will the market rally participation increase? Uh, getting back to uh, how I started the second quarter review comments, uh, in order for this to be a sustained bull market, we really need to see breadth in the stock market and more participation from other sectors and other asset classes. Um, and so we'll tackle that question uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, but Brian, why don't I hand the baton to you on this next slide and you can talk about uh, our allocation recommendations and really kind of uh, what happened in the second quarter in the first half of the year. Okay, here we go. So uh, hi, everybody. Let's start from the top, bonds. Uh, bonds had a terrible 2022 and had a kind of a rough 2021. The biggest reason for that in both of those cases was that bonds got far too overvalued uh, for the amount of yield that they provide. Because keep in mind, bonds really are here to do two things for us, provide recurring income and then give us our money back, right? That's really the contract we have with the bond. They're on the secondary market, so the prices move around, especially for lower quality, but essentially that's what we want them to do. In the year 2023, we have seen that, uh, that metric come back. Uh, the first quarter was really strong for bonds, uh, probably stronger even than it should have been because we started to see some more activity of, oh good, I'm getting yield again. The second quarter was a little bit negative. If you aggregate those two together, they're doing just fine. They're, uh, they're pretty much paying the coupon and they're holding their price. In most situations, that's what I want a bond to do. You can see in that right up there, we say that uh, the investors sort of pulled in. We saw some traders get shorter on duration. Uh, we're going to talk about yield curve. Can't go you know, these days without talking about yield curve. But essentially, right now, there is not an upside to going too far out in your bonds. That has proven to be true again in the second quarter. And we saw more traders pulling in, more buyers going into that short end. So we've got a little bit of a negative total return, but really strong yield. We would look to extend out if and when we see some opportunities there. Haven't seen it just yet, but we're always keeping our eye open for opportunities. Uh, the second bullet is domestic stocks. Uh, the second quarter was largely a repeat of the first quarter for certain stocks, the mega, mega big stocks. We're going to talk in more specifics about where they stand, but essentially they carried returns yet again. The third quarter, we're starting to see a bit more separation, which is good. Today, for example, was a big separator. Some uh, some drops in some of the really sort of uh, overpriced stocks, just to put it bluntly, some rally and some other ones. Hopefully that will continue. We continue to like our value bias, mostly just because trying to chase returns really in some of these stocks that are trading at massive multiples is just not a prudent approach. We wouldn't do that. Foreign stocks had a couple of interesting phenomena here. The first thing that was beneficial is that interest rate, or sorry, not interest rates, the dollar exchange rate 
got better. The dollar got weaker, which means it's good for foreign stock. Because every time we show someone a return, it's in domestic stock uh, values, right? So we have to exchange it back. We got some benefit from that, but also got some drag. Uh, even though inflation here, and we're going to talk about that again, of course, inflation here is looking better. Inflation in some other markets is not so much. And so they have those issues and places like Germany have crossed over some of the metrics for recession. On the emerging market side, uh, the trading at some nice valuations, good to see some, uh, some opening activity, reopening in places like China, except that China is specifically having some issues, unemployment and some debt issues. So that will bear uh, some more watching, <clears throat> excuse me, but overall love their valuations, love their yields. The fourth bullet has really been another area of, of great upside for us. We use, with says alternatives, we use one particular position there that has uh, had a really strong return this year and in previous years. It's a nice smoother, it has outperformed bonds, it's performed well just as a standalone option. And it's really nice because the volatility for it is truly different than stocks or bonds. We love that class and continue to hold a nice position there. Yeah, and I'd summarize um, kind of what we were recommending here today. Uh, which is continued diligence and continued diversification. And when we look at this next chart, um, you know, a few things really jump out. This is our, our quilt chart, we call it. Uh, and you can see large cap growth stocks are up 29%. And we're going to talk about some of the reasons why they might be overvalued, why an investor might uh, have caution in that space. But we are not recommending you abandon that space. In fact, that is a, a portion of all of our client portfolios uh, and in our asset allocation models. And we would we would suggest uh, maintaining that going forward. What we are looking at doing, though, is potentially uh, rebalancing or looking for opportunities elsewhere that might have a little bit more uh, risk reward uh, as we see it. So again, diversification and diligence, I think, are very important. Uh, not abandoning any of these asset allocations or any of these asset classes, but instead trying to identify the appropriate exposure for you. Uh, so how much is appropriate in any particular one of these asset classes based on your time horizon, based on your risk profile uh, and the assets we have invested on your behalf? So, uh, you know, we asked the question here, what's the deal with AI stocks? Uh, artificial intelligence has really been the story of the year. Brian, uh, talk about artificial intelligence and what has happened. Uh, how ha How has it really affected the stock market in a big way so far in 2023. It has been a theme. I think what's interesting here is that for those who maybe haven't followed uh, certain trends and themes in stocks, it might seem like this is a brand new phenomenon. It's not. I mean, the, the idea of artificial intelligence has been around since you know, the first robotics and computers 80 years ago. However, what we're getting here is a more concentrated and focused approach to saying, okay, artificial intelligence in this case is being uh, is intended to be utilized as uh, a way for more efficiency to try to help uh, to uh, speed up processes and things like writing and things like medical, you know, some more specific areas. So really, almost like when dot coms came out 25 years ago. Yes, you can say you're in that space, but how are you really using that to add value? On the left hand side here, you can see uh, you know multiple uh, charts of usage. The blue line is the one that's probably the most interesting, just because of the drama of that increase. That is chat GPT. There are other options there. You can see Bing, et cetera, Google. But the blue line, let's look at that one. Back in November 2022, almost no one was using this. There were probably some beta testers, things like that. And then instantly you see a half a billion. Or keep in mind, that scale there is not in hundreds of thousands or millions, right? That is hundreds of millions, which would add up to be billions up there at the top, right? So you're getting how many usages? half a billion, a billion, a billion and a half, almost 2 billion. What have we seen recently? Some modest uh, drops in usage, right? The new car smell maybe has gone away for some people. There were some people that were never gonna use this all the time. They just wanted to check it out because they read about it. That's natural. We got up to a peak. It is starting to come back down. Now the next question is going to be, how does this drive valuations for certain stocks? On the right-hand side, the stock du jour when it comes to AI has been NVIDIA. And for better or worse, it has um, you know, captured the attention and spiked in value. Okay, if you look at that blue, uh, the, the more uh, volatile line there, that is their history going back to 1999. Another caution here is just to say, you know, or not caution, but just a, an update. 
anyone who thinks that NVIDIA just came out you know, in relation to this uh, AI phenomenon, no, they've been around as a public company since 1999. They previously were known more for gaming. They have a history of having a more volatile price to sales. So this is not a PE ratio. This is a PS, right? Price per unit of sales. Uh, they are accustomed to being much more volatile on that number than both the S&P broad index and even the NASDAQ index, right? So this isn't relative to, like, say, uh, a utility company. This is relative to all companies. They have a history of being in the 10s and the 20s and the 30s. However, right now they're in the 40s and their price to earnings ratio is in the 200s. If you keep in mind, we're going to talk more about uh, PE ratios later, but just if, if an average is about a 16 or a 17, and even an average for a growth company is a 30, perhaps, they're at over 200, right? So they're going to really have to knock the socks off with revenues going forward to justify this. This is just one of those things where sometimes, you know, there's a bit of a mania to get into certain areas. This looks like one of those examples. Yeah. And, the, you know, the, the reason that they've rallied, they had blowout earnings and, um, they sell the chips that chat GPT uses for $16,000 each. So there is a great demand for these very expensive chips. And the market has definitely uh, been seeking out companies that have exposure to artificial intelligence. And really that is mostly concentrated in the top seven companies of the market. Uh, so there aren't a lot of companies out there with direct exposure to this market segment. And that has been what's been driving up markets. And, you know, one thing to keep in mind, and we mentioned earlier, not abandoning your asset allocation, but perhaps rebalancing. You look at the NASDAQ 100, which is a tech heavy index. Uh, that index is now about 60% uh, concentrated in the top 10. They're actually rebalancing that index next week in a, uh, a special rebalance in order to reduce that percentage to about 45%. So uh, even some of the index providers are dealing with this concentration issue and really trying to identify ways uh, to not have too much exposure in a, in a select few number of stocks. Uh, so let's move on to talk about a little bit of more economic discussion. And we asked the question, uh, you mentioned a recession. Uh, and uh, one thing I do want to point out is that the word recession doesn't have to be a scary word for investors. In fact, half of bull markets overlap with a recession. Uh, so what we're saying here, and, and I'll sum up the next few slides by saying, yes, we do still think there's a chance that we have a recession. We do not think it's very likely to be a severe recession. Uh, but some of the some of the charts we're going to show you on the next few slides, uh, you know, the one of, the, one of the most dangerous uh, phrases in finance are, this time it's different. Uh, so our view would be, instead of trying to outsmart the market, let's assume that history will guide us, will give us some indicator of what will happen. Uh, and we're going to show some slides that support that. Uh, but I do not want uh, you to leave this presentation thinking that means you should sell stocks. Because uh, in our view, uh, there's still opportunities out there and there are still places that you can invest uh, and have exposure to that will help you reach your investment goals. Uh, so let's start with the yield curve being inverted. And this is the classic recession indicator. Brian, uh, you know, what is uh, what are we looking at here? OK, yeah. So just kind of piggyback on what Eric said, uh, you know, from my personal view, do I think a recession is coming? Yes. Do I think it will be a bad one? No. So let's get into some of the indicators of why. Uh, one of there's multiple metrics that are usually used as an indicator. Uh, one of them being change in GDP. Keep in mind, last year we did have two negative quarters of GDP. That is not a that is not the technical definition of a recession, but it is sort of the anecdotal one. Keep that in mind. We do have that history already. But for going forward, one of the key drivers that usually does preclude or almost ha has always precluded a recession, with a few very small exceptions is an inverted yield curve. What does that mean? The nutshell version is I get paid more, for example, for holding a one-year treasury than I do a 30. Why would I do that? Because I assume that that 30-year isn't going to look as attractive down the line. I just want to hold something short, roll forward, waiting for rates to go down. This uh, chart shows all the way back to the 1970s that not only has this always uh, led to a recession, but it doesn't immediately do so. Look at those time gaps, right? They can be Right afterwards, they can be a long leg. The typical time frame from when it, uh, 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 oh, sorry, a yield curve inverts to when a recession is determined afterwards, looking back to have begun, 
is 12 to 24 months. When did we invert? Last July. We are in month 12 right now, right? Sometimes it can be much shorter of a time period, sometimes a bit longer. One of the longer ones was back in 2007, 2008. Again, do not think that we're in any situation like that. Please don't go away thinking that I said that we are like that. That was just an example of a time period where the lag was longer. Some other ones are almost right on top if you go back to the 1980s and such. So this indicator does have a very strong record of saying yes, this one is saying yes, but it has been saying yes for a while now. So there's always kind of, there's a, a judgment call on both sides there. Yeah, some other indicators uh, that I think are worth pointing out, we'll just walk through on the next few slides rather rather quickly here. Um, but again, manufacturing uh, has been uh, slowing down. The Philly manufacturing or the Philly Fed manufacturing index actually has been in recession territory. Uh, that's also been a very strong indicator of a coming recession. Uh, what about the leading economic indicator? Something that's looking forward. Uh, the conference board has, uh, you know, a, a survey that 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 uh, of four leading economic indicators, as shown here on this chart, that also is indicating that a recession is coming. Uh, and then more anecdotally here, uh, bankruptcy filings have been increasing. We're seeing some uh, movement there of recession indicators. Uh, so when you take all of these together. Uh, our objective is not to ignore them, but to account for them and to invest accordingly around them. Uh, but uh, they're not definitive. Uh, and in fact, many uh, Wall Street uh, economists have been forecasting a lower percentage of a recession uh, as we've been moving through throughout this year, especially with the strength of the stock market. And you look at uh, Goldman Sachs this week announced a 20% chance of a recession. So not everybody is, is forecasting a recession. There's definitely a mixed bag. And Brian, some of that mixed bag is, is really on this, this slide right here. I think if you're going to avoid a recession, uh, this is the reasons why. Or if it's going to be a shallow recession, really it's the severity of these charts. What are we looking at right here and why are they important? So this one is hugely important, right? I could stack up a massive number of indicators that say yes on the one side, and you only need some very strong ones to say no on the other side to balance those out. And one of those is gonna be wages, right? It's gonna be uh, workforce and wage growth. And why is that most important? Because we are a consumer-driven society. We need wages and we need people to feel rich or feel comfortable even to make the purchases that they want to make, need to make, et cetera. What do we have here on the top? Labor participation rate. We are used to somewhere around 63 to 64% of eligible people working. Why isn't it more than that? Because a lot of people are retired, right? This only means you're within an age group where that is possible. And you also have some people that stay at home, et cetera. We had a very consistent rate and then it dropped like a rock. We all know why it dropped like a rock back in 2020. And then it rallied back up. The good news is it continues to rally back up. There was a time there, though, you can see about 2022 or so, where it sort of paused, right? It did not get materially higher. Then, uh, as I, my guess is, as people kind of looked at their pocketbooks and went, hmm, yeah, I probably do need to start making money again. Then they started to come back into the force. Uh, so that number has risen back up. It isn't quite as high as it was. It might not get quite as high as it was just given the age demographic. So we don't necessarily think it will get back to or don't look for it to get back to 64 or 65. But even if it can just stay constant in that 62, 63 range, that's good. Those percentages also might seem very tight until you keep in mind that those each one of those percentage points is about a million and a half people. So this is real, right? These are real numbers. Down below, here's the bugaboo of the Fed. It's wage growth. Right. If you see that that had been on a fairly consistent sort of a slow trend up with a lot of volatility there, but that trend line was very modest and then boom, took off like a rocket ship. Right. Lots of cash out there, big cash outlays to businesses and to people. Those then pass their sales through to uh, to paychecks. This isn't necessarily across the board. This doesn't go into um, it doesn't delineate by income strata. But uh, I could just tell you that $200,000 income people didn't automatically go to 250, right? It wasn't like that. But on a per hour basis, those folks that maybe were making 12 might be making 15. 15 might now be making 20. For them, on an absolute basis, that you know, for us, I would say on an absolute basis, that doesn't seem like a big difference of money. For them, on a relative basis, it sure does. And that increases activity, but it also increases the willingness and the ability to pay more. That leads into the inflation talk.
Yeah, and, and it's really difficult to reconcile this wage growth that we've seen with the recession indicators that you see on the previous slides. Um, and, and really the compromise position there, and, and I think the one that, uh, that Cutler has settled on, is the mild recession is the outcome that, that we think uh, kind of accounts for both of these economic inputs and really uh, does put the economy, um, you know, taking everything here into account, put the economy uh, where we think it will be over the next year or two. Uh, the next slide that we're going to show you also is go going to definitely impact the severity of a, of a potential recession. Um, and that's where we talk about households. Uh, and Brian, uh, we show this slide every, every quarter on our webinar, uh, and it's really the household balance sheet. Uh, has anything changed from last quarter? And, and can you summarize where things are for, for everybody watching today? Sure. So I'd say uh, in summary, we are still looking good, but there are some warning signs, right? Just like with so many of the other things on the recession talk, we're still not there, but there are some warning signs, but there are also some positive signs. Here, the positive sign would be that left-hand side. We talked about this and I have noted before that households on an assets to liabilities ratio have tended to be about eight to nine parts assets to one part liability. That's fantastic. That's absolutely great. That is still true. If you look there, it is almost exactly eight to one. That's fantastic. Where is this coming from though? Homes, other financial assets, which is a wide basket. That's for brokerage accounts, that's your uh, retirement funds that are not pensions, et cetera. The good news is the breadth, right? It isn't half from homes. It isn't half from financial assets. It, there isn't one factor that would have a big drag on this that would be catastrophic, right? Back in 2007, this ratio was very heavy on homes. That is not the case anymore. The other part about homes specifically that's good news is look at the liabilities. Two thirds of our liabilities are in the form of mortgages. Our mortgages are almost all in the form of fixed rate. It's about 90-ish percent of them are on a fixed rate basis because during this time of the last few years, when you could get a 3%, a 4%, some even in the 2%, said, yes, let's lock in. You know, I had this conversation. We had this conversation here with many clients and said, absolutely, right? In almost every case, this looks like a good deal. Those are now locked in. Other marketplaces like England and lots of Europe, for example, do not have that sort of phenomenon. They don't have as many fixed rate mortgages. They're dealing with increases. Up in Canada, there is some talk now, literally of 70 and 80 year long mortgages to try to stretch out the payments because rates have become uh, just so uncomfortable for people to be able to pay. Here in the United States, we don't have that situation. That's good news. But let's talk about on the right-hand side, some trends and which one of those might start to be a bit of a bugaboo here. Top right, household debt service ratio is still containable. It is far lower than 2007. It's even still lower than back in 1980. However, that trend line is start, starting to go, or sorry, not starting to, continuing to go up. How much further will that go up? That is going to be the question mark there. It is very controllable right now, but we're starting to see some leaks in very specific parts of, uh, of repayment schedules. Which parts are those in particular? Look down at the bottom there. Auto and credit card, we're starting to see more delinquencies. The trend line is against us. They are getting higher. However, look at history. We're still below history. So just like up above, it's not bad. It's getting, what was the way to put it? It's getting worse, but it's not bad. Right, so what we need to watch for is, will it continue to get worse? And one area that's really gonna be important there is that orange line, that is student loans. Why is that flat for the last two years? Because there haven't been a lot of student loan payments, right? There, there was some freezes, there was lots of uh, court wrangling going on. As of now, almost all of that debt, not all of it, but almost all of that is gonna be scheduled to start getting repaid in about two months. That will have an impact, of course. The question mark there will be some trade-offs, what has to get cut? Where do we have to accommodate that for those where it applies? That's still to be determined. But those, so that's the punchline here is still good, but some things to watch out for. Yeah, and these next two charts are kind of showing the same thing and uh, a little bit more specificity here. Uh, credit card accounts assessed interest. Uh, you can see credit card interest has not had a rate this high uh, really in the history of, of this chart, which goes back to 1994. Uh, so credit, you know, credit card debt right now is definitely something to monitor and to keep an eye out from the health of the consumer standpoint. On the right side, household interest payments. And, and we've already mentioned uh, that 90% of Americans have a fixed rate mortgage. 
Uh, that really implies that a lot of this spike that we're seeing is not related to mortgage interest, but is other interest that has gone up. Um, obviously, some of that during 21 and 22 was mortgage interest as people were buying houses at higher and higher uh, prices. Uh, and, and you began to see uh, uh, interest related to those higher prices. But as we sit here in 2023, it's primarily those non-fixed assets, those credit card payments, uh, maybe some uh, uh, some adjustable rate mortgages, uh, your home equity line of credit, uh, your auto loan, uh, things like that. Your auto loan might be fixed, but um, those rates have been very high of late. So those types of rates are really what are putting a lot of pressure on consumers right now. And that'll be something important to monitor uh, for the depth of a potential recession. Uh, let's move on to talk about housing and housing affordability. And on that consumer balance sheet, you saw 27% of the uh, consumer assets are related to housing. So obviously that is a very, if not the most important uh, sector of our economy for the overall health of, of investor of, of consumers or for every American. Um, uh, it's an important part of our economy. And you can see here with rates at around 7%, uh, housing affordability has really dragged on. We've only seen, though, 1% of houses sell uh, across the entire country in the first six months of this year. And the reason for that is we've had um, we've had higher rates, but with a lot of fixed uh, mortgages out there, people can't afford to move. Uh, so people uh, can't sell their house at a 3% mortgage and go buy one of equal value at a 7% mortgage. So the mobility that we've seen in our economy has really been limited. And for clients that are out there looking for a new house who under their life circumstances need to be able to move or need to be able to buy a house right now, what we're advising really is adjustable rate mortgages, uh, looking at maybe a three or five year arm. Uh, hopefully the yield curve uh, will materialize. Uh, we'll have a, a chart in a couple of slides about that. Uh, in terms of where interest rates are headed and, and what type of refinancing you might be able to do in a couple of years. Uh, so uh, one other way to look at affordability, Brian, uh, this is a very colorful chart. Uh, I think it, it tells you a lot about what's happening. It's a similar way of looking at that past chart. Uh, can you walk us through this? Sure, yeah. So what I love about this chart is it's not on an absolute scale, right? This is relative to the past. This is change in pace. Right. So this doesn't mean that it's you know, like those numbers there aren't saying a 20 percent mortgage rate, et cetera. It's saying what factors impact the ability for someone to buy a house. We've seen in recent years. So the, the black part of those lines is income. We know that wages have risen. This plays that out. If you look for the last two years, all the black area is positive. We know that house price has been a drag. House price increases have made it harder to afford a house. Obviously, if something costs more, it's harder to afford. We've seen that drag down in the blue side, but the biggest drag has been the change, the pace of change in mortgage rates, right? The And for those who have lived through the 80s and the 70s, you remember our rates today, a seven was someone, oh, woe is me, it's a seven. You're like, yeah, right, I paid a 15 or an 18, but those didn't change as fast as they have now. If you locked in a rate last February and you got a 30 year fixed, there's a very good chance your first number was a two. There's a very good chance that first number today, if you're lucky, is a six. Some of us, it's a seven. So the pace of change here is more dramatic, literally, you can see it on that page, than anything that's been faced going all the way back to the financial crisis of 2008. All of those other factors, right? House prices did climb back in 2008 and nine because it came out of a depressed time when there was you know, a lot lack of activity. The big drag here also is the double factor, right? House prices are still going up, although very recently that hasn't been quite as much of a factor, but those mortgage rates, right? That double whammy is making it hard. You might make 10% more than you did before uh, the last couple of years, but the affordability of a house is even harder for you to try to overcome. So this this really leads us into interest rates, and I you know I think this might be a record uh, for our webinars over the last couple of years, Brian. We're about a half an hour into it now, and we haven't really brought up interest rates or the Fed yet. Uh, so let's talk about the Fed and, and what's happening uh, because there has been a great deal of movement. Uh, you can see the the yellow line here is what the futures were predicting in March. 
And the blue line is what the futures were predicting in June. And we could show this chart over and over again over the last couple of years, and it would be similar, similarly wrong. Uh, the, the futures market has consistently understated the need for the Fed to raise rates during this cycle. And uh, it's been very optimistic about rates coming down, uh, mostly because it's been optimistic about inflation coming down as well. And yet inflation, as you'll see on the next slide, has been stickier than expected. And the question really from, from where we sit today is, will it continue to be stickier than, than expected? Uh, and our view has been that the Fed will maintain higher rates longer than the market has been, been, been projecting. And that view is primarily based on the fact that the Fed is telling us they're going to do that. Uh, the Fed really wants to keep rates higher until inflation has come back to their targets of 2%. And we've had uh, now, I believe, 11 straight months of declining headline inflation. As you can see on this chart, we peaked last year at 9.1%, and our last headline number, uh, which which this, this slide does not show, but it came in under three. So 2.97 was the most recent headline number. And that's great news. Uh, you know, headline on the way up is what everybody's focused on. Uh, and on the way down, uh, people look at core, uh, but headline is really what we're spending on a day-to-day -day basis because it includes things like food and energy, which are real expenses for us as consumers. But what the Fed is focused on really is more the core indicators and core inflation does not include food. It does not include energy. Uh, and the reason is that energy prices have huge volatility. Food prices have huge volatility. So let's focus on the things that that might might have less noise and be more re uh, more reflective of what's happening out there in the economy. Brian, why has core been so sticky, uh, and and what do we think is going to happen from here? So the hardest part with the stickiness on core is that they are, uh, it's primarily services and services don't tend to go down, right? Like if I am accustomed to paying a certain amount for an eye exam, which I happen to have just recently done, I know it's not going to be cheaper than it was two years ago. It used to go on a pretty steady trudge up and then they're starting to see some, you know, some more elevated climbs there. If you look at the breakout on that right-hand side, you see the red dominates a lot of that uh, of those uh, bars there right especially recently it is by far the biggest piece transportation services that's going to be and it's not it, it excludes airfare and such a uh, clarify that's the blue which by the way happens to be the only thing that had come down if you see that negative part unfortunately as i know because i just bought some tickets they've come back up again so that does have more volatility than some of the other sticky pieces but the red area has been really difficult. Things related to transportation because the services of those, say like you go get your car fixed or you need some maintenance or things like that, it's those kind of um, behind the scenes costs that are very difficult, right? I can't necessarily go in and find one of those services on sale. I can't find a coupon for it all the time. Sometimes you can, but not all the time. So that area has been very stubborn. And uh, you also get some things like rents, which have been very stubborn. Uh, so some of those core areas, uh, this one in particular should also say, as it says up top, does also exclude shelter. So this really does take away some of those drivers that have been very dramatic and shows that even without those, this has still been sticky. Some of these are tough because they just don't, just by their nature, they don't go down. We're accustomed to other things going down around them, and, they, and many of them have, but some of these have been really hard to, to, uh, to take a bite out of. Yeah, but this chart on the right is is an important uh, determinant of how uh, the economy is going to react going forward in terms of giving the Fed latitude to lower rates. Uh, if we have a slowing economy, but inflation remains sticky, uh, the Fed is really going to be in a tough position because they won't really want to lower rates with that sticky inflation. Uh, so keep an eye on this core number. Uh, we think it's key in terms of what those Fed futures are actually going to materialize into when we think it's going to come down and the Fed's going to be able to react to that. That's a great opportunity to push bond yields out further or bond duration out further in your portfolio, maybe moving out of those short-term bonds or those money market funds that are yielding close to 5% or around 5% and locking in maybe some of those longer rates as you see inflation dropping, uh, taking advantage of that dynamic. Uh, so the last section of our presentation, uh, will the rest of the market rally? 
Uh, and uh, our, our bull markets typically last 2.7 years. The current uh, market cycle started uh, last uh, October. So we're 11 months from last year's bottom. Uh, but we need broader participation for this bull market to continue. It cannot continue to climb on the backs of just the magnificent seven, as some people have called the, the seven largest companies out there. Uh, Brian, uh, mega cap names dominate. Is the AI boom sustainable is the question that we're asking here. Oh, is it sustainable at these levels? I just don't see how that's possible. I really don't. Uh, no offense to the specific companies. They probably all have great reasons to for the proponents to say that they're you know justified where they are. But the macro level view here is no. So let's break into the numbers. Are stocks broadly expensive right now? They are a bit, but it's not outlandish. How do I know that? I look at the black line in that box there. S&P 500 aggregate looking forward. This isn't current. This is forward expected earnings from JP Morgan, 19. Okay, 19 is a little bit rich. I'm more used to the 15 to 17 range. You can see the average there, 16 and a half. 19 versus 16 and a half. Okay, that's within a deviation or two of what I would consider to be normal. But let's drag up. What is abnormal? The top 10 having a current look forward PE ratio of 29. I can tell you that right now today, just off some back of the napkins that I did, the blended current right now is closer to 40. That's not sustainable, right? And a couple of those are dragging that up because they're over 100. One of them's over 200. It's a stock we already talked about. Relative to history, it's not unusual for the top 10 to be more expensive. If you look at that average, the average is 20 versus a broader average of 16 and a half, right? You see that right there in the middle. Okay. I am used to them being more expensive. I'm not used to them being 50% more expensive or more specifically 45. That 145% of average means those top 10 are 45% more expensive, not than the broad market usually is, but than they usually are. This is getting to the point of, I mean, you see lots of headlines, even from those traders that were making the buys of what's going on right now, right? But this is another reminder. That doesn't mean all stocks are expensive. What this really means is a lot of stocks are inexpensive because they are below what would be typically what we'd look for, even in the potential for a recessionary environment, because these other ones are just so far over their skis. Yeah. And, you know, it, another Wall Street expression, Brian, I think Milton Friedman said it, is uh, the market be can remain irrational longer than I can remain solvent. And, you know, the, this dynamic doesn't necessarily have to change. Uh, those mega cap stocks could continue to trade at above market multiples. And, you know, we're not abandoning that sector of the marketplace. What we're saying is when you're constructing portfolios and when you're building portfolios, uh, that diversification matters. Let's let's maybe rebalance into some of those undervalued or unloved uh, sectors of the economy. Uh, but let's not abandon those other sectors, especially because they become such important parts of the overall stock market. You want to have exposure to those mega cap names. Uh, one thing that could be driving this dynamic a little bit is really the onset of, and this is this is getting a little bit into how the sausage is made, and we won't we won't dig into it too much. Uh, but really the onset of short dated options. And, and Brian, let's talk about options and what's happening because this has really been an interesting development over the last, really over the last year uh, of what's happening out there. Yeah, I would, I would, I'm going to caution myself to not get too nerdy here, but this is important to note. Uh, options have always been a part of market trading. They're a good hedge. They're a good way to sort of project out where prices could go. At the highest level, I would say this, instead of buying Microsoft share today, I will buy an option contract that says I can buy a share of it six months from now, for example, at either like $20 below today's price or $20 above today's price. Why would I do the $20 below? Because I think it will go, that, that will be a good buy. I will want to have it at that price because I think it will not drop that far down, but someone else will sell it to me for that much. Why would I buy the one above? Because I think it's going to shoot off like a rocket ship and I want to be able to buy that at a better price. Okay, in the past, and this goes back to 2011, so we're not talking about 50 years, but we are talking about over a decade. That would be 5%, 10%. It even started crossing into 20% of daily activity, right? Out of a thousand shares traded on a given day, 
50 of them became about 200 of them were in this space. We're on these short options, not just options, but short options. Now it's 40, 45, 50%. And that trend line, it hasn't slowed down. It could cross over 50% here very soon. Why is this important? Because now what I'm doing is I'm not trade, I'm not buying Microsoft because I think it's a good 10-year holding. I'm, I'm sorry, many people are. These options traders are not. They're buying it because they think the price two days from now could be a dollar more or a dollar less or $5 more, $5 less, whatever it might be. Why is this important? Because what this is doing is kind of containing volatility, but really in an artificial way, right? It's saying, I'm not concerned so much about where the price is going. I'm concerned about where it's going for my little window of time. What that does is really suppress real volatility and also pushes prices towards a given known because I have to sort of fill that, uh, that vacuum, if you will. So what's happening here is twice a day, almost automatically in the morning and then later in the later morning, we're getting activity just based off of the expiration of these options. That is, um, uh, that's manipulating is, I know it's kind of a tough word, but it is having a direct impact on price that has nothing to do with fundamentals. It is only based on where my option will end. That is, uh, that's, that's concerning for those who really want to look at whether a stock is quality buy or not at where it is. Yes, yeah, so we have just a, a couple more slides. Uh, this next one, I really was, want to highlight two things uh, very briefly on this slide. One is the concentration of Apple. Uh, Apple's now a $3.4 trillion company. You can see on the top chart here, it makes up more of the S&P 500 than any company in the last 40, 40 plus years. Uh, so uh, Apple has become in many ways uh, so important uh, that uh, it will influence what the averages do one way or another. Uh, given the size of that particular company. And, and you know, we've, we've kind of mentioned this over and over, but there are a handful of companies also that do have very large exposures just behind App Apple on this chart. Uh, on the bottom, there's been a divergence this year between growth and value, as well as the yield curve. And you can see, uh, historically, it's trended fairly consistently. Uh, that has diverged in a big way this year. Uh, mostly, we would attribute that to the, the AI uh, boom and and investors getting in on that and that trend for artificial intelligence. Um, but again, that's just uh, that's something where market expectations or I guess the expected behavior has diverged from what what you might anticipate. Uh, Brian, this is this is just a broad valuation chart. Uh, it shows the S and P five hundred uh, going back to nineteen ninety six. And where are we today from a valuation standpoint? And uh, and what does that mean for investors from here? So what this would tell me is that we are kind of to carry on to what we said before, we're a little bit stretched, right? Uh, but it's very specific about where that stretching is coming from. If you look here and you look in the box in the middle in particular, I can see that that 19 forward PE today, based on the earnings as we know them, they're closer to 22. But either way, the 19 does have historical precedence. What is uh, unique though, is that we don't tend to have valuations that high when you also have treasury yields that high. If you see the 2020 and 2000, early 2022 episodes, I was willing to pay more for my stocks because my treasury yields were almost nothing, right? One and a half, essentially, and one and a half. Now they're closer to four. That trade-off makes it a little bit harder for me to say that this valuation at the macro level is, uh, is defensible, right? It's just a little too stretched. But looking at that chart from a couple ago, it doesn't mean they're all stretched. It just means that we've been stretched by a few of these very specific players. That has been the driver of, were we too low in October? Absolutely, yes. Are we sort of a little uh, over a little top heavy right now? Yes, absolutely. But there are opportunities out there. I just know from seeing, you know, lifting the hood, the divergence here is so extreme that there are opportunities. It's just at the macro level, it might look a bit rich. So let's, let's look at a few of those opportunities. This is our last slide here and, uh... You know, I, I don't know if any of you have picked up on, but the pictures that we include on the background of today's webinar are a little bit of Easter eggs in terms of uh, showing kind of what our thoughts. And, and this picture in the background is there are many fish in the sea. And, and you know, investors shouldn't get too focused on any one or I guess uh, any one stock or any one asset class um, because there's always opportunities out there. And you know, one thing that we can see here on the left side of this chart, uh, the left chart shows equities, the right chart shows fixed. I'll let Brian cover fixed income here in a second. But um, yes, U.S. valuations are above 
their their median. Uh, the purple line here is the 25 year average price to earnings ratio. And, and in general, US stocks trade higher than most other economies. And there's reasons for that. US companies have the best rule of law. We have the deepest uh, and most liquid investment markets out there. We've had very consistent uh, interest rates with, with generally low inflation over time. That that's a great environment for people to invest, and our stocks should really command a premium over the rest of the world, and that's reflected here on the purple bars on this chart, with the one exception of Japan, who has had zero percent inflation and negative interest rates for most of this time period, and so um, you know Japan also traded an elevated valuation. Uh, but look at where we are today with the the light blue diamonds here. Uh, the U.S. is well above that purple line, uh, Japan well below, Europe well below, emerging markets slightly above, China well below. So around the globe, uh, there's a lot of opportunities uh, when you consider relative valuations to that particular investment, uh, that investment market's averages. Uh, I would point out both Europe and Japan here is looking particularly attractive vis-a-vis uh, -vis where they historically are. And the reason why they might be at a discount today, Brian already mentioned Germany, for example, is in a recession. Uh, the UK has very high inflation right now. Uh, the US has has really, you know, we have high inflation, but we're ahead of the curve relative to much of the world. And, and so the rest of the world is maybe playing catch up and you're seeing them having to raise rates while we're nearing the end of our rate hiking cycle, uh, that's benefited both foreign currencies as the as the currencies have played off against each other, but also perhaps uh, the timing of various investments. Um, you know, they might zig when we zag. Uh, that's the benefits of diversification. And again, getting back to slide number one on this presentation, uh, if there's one thing we want uh, our clients to walk away with, it's the importance of diversification and really maintaining a balanced portfolio that is catered toward your investment risks. Uh, part of that balance for, for many of our clients, if not most of our clients, are bonds. And Brian, uh, how do bonds look here on the right side? How can uh, how can people be investing in the bond market in this environment? You know, so talking about diversification, uh, there are more bonds out there and many more bond classes than there are stocks, right? So there's many to choose from, but they tend to get thought of as a basket, right? I have those bonds, they pay some income, I wish I had them in bad stock years. Why don't why do I have them in good stock years? We have worked through one of the worst periods for bonds in history, right? If you look at that right-hand side with all those pink numbers, all those negatives, three-year, five-year, 10-year, this has been a rough run for bonds, but we made it through. We popped through the other side. And the good news is, if you look at that white column right in the middle there, 30-day yield, this is the amount you're getting paid for various types of bond instruments right now. What's the good news here? I see a lot of those numbers in the fours, fives, sixes, even the eights, right? The eights could be a little extreme. You want to watch out for those. If you're getting paid that much, there's probably some additional risk. But in particular, like the one that I look at, oh, it's about six or seven down, U.S. investment grade, 5.2% current yield. And they've had a rough run, right? The total return because bonds got way overpriced. But right now, what do I want those for? Pay me recurring income. I want to take a modest amount of credit risk, as little as I need to, to get the yield I'm looking for. You can do that now. We sort of hit the reset button. We had a ter we had a great 2018 and 19, more than we should have. We had a terrible 2021 and 22 because we got overdone on bonds. Like kind of, you know, the world did. And now we've hit the reset button. We're starting fresh, looking forward, really strong yields, broad diversification, lots of opportunities here. We really like the upside for bonds for going forward. Right now, we want to be on the short end. We're always going to look for chances to change that. Uh, and with that, I just want to say thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we will make a copy of this presentation available on our website uh, shortly. And feel free to come back and revisit anything we had to say or give us a call and, and talk about it. We'd love to talk through what we talk, what we presented here today uh, and, and how it might impact you. But thank you for your time. And we appreciate you joining us. And uh, we'll talk to you next quarter, if not sooner. Thank you all very much.